Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Legion 99 podcast, your source for the latest tactics, news, battle reports, hobby talk, and general Legion chatter. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Legion 99 podcast. Um, my name is Mike. This week, I'm joined by my good buddy, Rich, and we have a slew of cool stuff to talk about. Rich, how are you doing this week? Doing well, Mike. Doing well. Another good week in the bag. Yeah, it's been a strange week. It's been a... Uh... A little out of the ordinary for me, so I'm kind of glad to roll into a new one. Um, But, you know, it's always nice to do an early Sunday morning podcast with the boys, so excited to be here. And we're going to touch on quite a few things today. Um, We're going to talk a little bit about the tournament that you just went to over the weekend. Um, We're going to briefly touch on Unlimited a little bit, because it is a thing. Uh, We're going to talk about the competitive season that was and what we're hoping to see next year. We've got some new keywords to speculate about because it's been ages since we've been able to do that. And um, after we talk about the tournament that you went to, Rich, we're going to talk a little bit about how you actually use game results to evaluate a list. You know, what are your your caveats? What do you look for? You know, basically, how do you break that down? Um, but it should be a good time. Yeah. So I do want to do some plugs to start with before we kind of get into everything. Um, we do have some upcoming events that are not just Adepticon. Um, If you're local to myself or to the eastern Philadelphia, New Jersey area, um, check out our South Jersey Discord. We've got a nice little running tally of everything there. Um, For those of you who are not local to me, um, we do have a Patreon for Fifth Trooper. So if you don't mind checking that out as well, it'd be really appreciated. Any of your support is fantastic so that we can, you know, help keep the recording and everything going. And I think that's about it. Rich, I think you went to uh, not only a tournament, over the weekend, but also a little pre-release yesterday, right? Yeah, I went to the pre-release for uh, Star Wars Unlimited, the new card game from FFG. Um, kind of feels a little bit like Commander, but uh, with Star Wars characters, which is amazing. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I know our buddy uh, Mike Jem is out there doing some big stuff with it. I know Kingsley is on your network with it. It, it feels like... Uh, the start of the next big thing in 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 gaming, uh, in terms of a competitive card game, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm hoping to get into it after a couple sets drop. Um, I'm not a not a huge fan of jumping in at the ground level, but I think I'll wait a couple months, get a little bit of an explosion. You know, one of the things that FFG has always nailed is characters and themes, uh, and these. It's wild how much a card can feel like a character. <laughs> yeah, even with the slightly unique art style, it still does get that feel. Yeah, I, I like the art style. I like. I think it's easier to be timeless in a art style that's all of your own rather than trying to copy an art style from other games and systems. It's also less to license. Also so you less to license. Got that running out. <laughs> Which, as we have learned, is a thing with LFL. <laughs> For better or worse. But yeah, if you're if you're interested in any of the content there, like we mentioned, we do have some some articles on the website um, written by I think Davis Kingsley. Uh, he was pretty pretty competitive in Legion for a while. I know he shifted focus a little bit. Um, and then our our good buddy Bobby Sapphire, uh, who is with the Hyperloops, has the Kashyyyk Train of Dominance YouTube channel as well, where they've been doing uh, basically daily videos. What an incredible name. Yeah, I read it the first time, and I wasn't really sure that I read it correctly. <laughs> I had to go back and double check. <laughs> I, lo- I love it. That's a great name. It is cool. It's also it's a cool channel. Um, he's a good friend of ours, so appreciate it if he's checked it out. Um, but I think that's basically it for the plugs. We should probably start talking about Legion. That's what we're here for. Yeah, let's. Uh, I know we have the schedule on the right side. Let's start with the new keywords. Let's start with the news. So unexpectedly, this past week, we got an RRG update that included a fair few number of keyword, new keywords and keyword updates for units that are upcoming. And um, it kind of came, as far as I'm aware, out of the blue, um, because the units themselves actually haven't released yet, especially like some of the Inquisitors. But it is not unwelcome. This felt like one of the old school drops that we used to get where all of a sudden the RRG updated and we have brand new news to speak of on a week when there was no other news to speak of. Uh, and it was, when when you pop that into the Discord, I got excited because, man, it's been a while since we've just had, like, 
a tidbit. Not not enough to like know for sure where this unit's going to have it or what's going to be on it or what it's going to look like, but just a little bit of like speculation and, and wild curiosity and the keywords are for for sure you can you can definitely plug them into probably where they're going to be, but you can't know that for sure either. So it's it's great. Yeah. It's also been like a year and a half since we've been able to speculate on things. So <laughs> I'm just pretty excited to be able to do that again. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the first keyword um, so... was uh, advanced targeting unit keyword. Uh, which... Hey, do you want to read what it does? Yeah, so uh, I don't have the, the text up right beside me, but I believe that it's when this unit targets uh, a rank that is specified on the card, they gain x number of aims equal uh to what x is so uh probably on the range troopers what i'm thinking uh and whenever you target say a corp or an operative or a commander or a special force depending on what the rank that 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 it specifies on their card you're going to gain x number of aims so probably two maybe one uh depending on how generous they want to be with it and that's just bonkers cool yeah, it's so when a unit with the advanced targeting X keyword declares an attack against an enemy unit with the unit type listed, before measuring range, it may gain X aim tokens. A unit that uses the advanced targeting X keyword may only form one attack pool and skips the declare additional defender step of the attack sequence. So there's two really interesting things here. Um, this would trigger before long shot um, because it's before measuring range. So you'd be able to get your aims before you actually... You know, potentially use something like long shot to boost your range, um, and you can't split fire with it. It makes it also it... says unit type, which is kind of curious. Does that mean like rank? Does that mean vehicle trooper? I droid? I thought it meant rank, uh, because it. I mean, that feels like to me something that is a little easier to make an all for one. Whereas if you just make it a trooper, that's that's everything, um, or. A vehicle, it's less useful than what it would be as just a rank. Uh, I also, I mean, it makes sense that you can't split fire because then you can just generate that amount of aims multiple times. Um, right, you just chuck like one die towards <laughs> whatever your target is, get three aims, and say, hey, I'm going to use it for the other pool. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so it, it makes sense there. Um, I'm expecting to see that probably on both the clone commandos and the range troopers. Um I think it. I think it has a place on both of them, in terms of just being able to do some some heavy loaded damage, uh, with 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 hopefully large dice pools. Yeah, I kind of think it would be interesting as a. I don't want to call it an impact replacement, but an impact adjacent. Because if you made it say against vehicles, maybe it's a way to to just make like a better rocket launcher. Like just instead of just being the HH twelve that just has impact three, maybe it's like impact one, critical one, but you get extra aims with it. You know, something just like not necessarily an upgrade or a downgrade, but a side grade option to that. We could use more side grades. We could, yeah. It's it's nice. It would be nice to not have to just take an RPS if I want impact, but like maybe give myself something else. So, I was thinking if it is on the range finders or clone commandos, it's got to be against operatives slash commanders. Uh which I like the idea of troops that are specifically designed to hunt a specific other troop, uh, which is not a thing that we currently have, right? You know? No, it's basically limited to Jedi Hunter. Yeah. And so, like, being able to be like, this this squad of range troopers, this squad of clone commandos, they're here for hunting commanders, they're here for hunting uh, operatives, and when they get to do that, it's going to be uh, explosive. Yeah, I'm excited. It's a cool keyword, and uh, I think it'll be a nice little injection of change. Uh, next up, we had the associate unit keyword uh, added. We, we already knew what that did. That was on um, Seventh Sister. Uh, so it just allows you to ignore the rank uh, of that person if she's included in if they're included in the same army as their associate. Uh, probably expecting to see this one come up on canon or, or Ezra when we finally get them. Uh, we're looking 
you know, way out. Probably some of the Bad Batch guys are going to have it uh, to be able to, you know, have more of them if they're not a single unit. Yeah, it, it seems like very much a <clears throat> named character keyword. Unfortunately, oh. it's the same text that we have on the reminder um, for the actual card on Seven Sister as well. So nothing weird happened there. Keeping them simple. Uh, the next one, one up thing is... It doesn't seem simple. Oh, sorry. Is complete the mission. I was to say, complete oh, the yeah. mission does not seem super simple, but I think it presents a really cool dynamic. So complete the mission is not a command card, even though it is, but it's also a unit keyword. Um, during setup, for each friendly unit with complete the mission keyword, place a friendly priority mission token on the battlefield, not within any deployment zone. While a unit with the complete the mission keyword is at range one of a friendly priority mission token, that unit gains surge block defensively. When a unit with the complete the mission keyword attacks an enemy unit at range one of a friendly priority mission token, the attacking unit's attack pool gains the critical two keyword. Uh, that is a amazing keyword. I love that keyword. Uh for, for multiple reasons. One, the play with it is a massive decision point. Uh, and whenever you're adding decision points into the game, I'm always a fan of it. You're now deciding when you place your complete the mission uh, priority token, whether you're placing it next to your opponent, where they're going to be fighting so that you can get extra critical shots into them, whether you're going to put it next to, uh, say, the center KP so that you're able to have search to block when you get up there uh, or or you're getting to dictate where the battlefield is or potentially push your opponent to not want to fight where that battlefield could be. Um, and so it, it's really nice. I, it's very dynamic uh, and it gives you a lot of options to, to change how you're playing and what you're playing against. Yeah, we just spent a lot of the last episode talking about... Um more mobile armies like Genosians and such and how important it is to identify before the game starts where the actual fight takes place and this gives you a way not only to define an additional place where the fight might occur but also give you a way to mitigate any kind of issues that you might see against your opponent i think this is a really neat keyword we haven't had like i'm going to call it a mini game keyword but we haven't had a mini game keyword since secret mission yeah and obviously secret mission comes with the victory point aspect you know we've got bounty secret mission but this one with the text that we have doesn't seem to have a victory point attached to it, which I think is really good. It gives another just level of play. And like you said, decision-making without actually influencing um, the physical score of the game. The, the fact that it doesn't have a victory token attached to it means that you can put this on a few more things uh, that can help, you know, each other help the, the unit that, that has it, uh, I'm looking forward to see where we where, where we get this one. I, I, I can imagine that this is on Bad Batch. I can imagine this is on Clone Commandos. Uh, but it could also be on the range troopers too, right? Because I'm thinking back to that solo scene. They're on the train. They're trying to protect the train. Uh, and, and that seems like a nice way to level up Empire uh, by giving them some surge to block without having to give them surge mm -hmm. tokens. That would be cool, um, you know, potentially, because it looks like it's, oh, it's the unit with the keyword, never mind. I was going to say you could spread it to short yeah. troopers, but that is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let, let's not get short troopers there to search to block anymore. Man, I miss my shores, okay? <laughs> I search every day for a way to bring them back. <laughs> um, one thing that I am really curious about, and obviously we're not going to get this answered until said unit releases, um, it says, when a unit with the keyword attacks an enemy unit at range one of a friendly priority mission token, does that mean that you have to be at range one when you shoot, or you're attacking the opponent at range one of the token? Because that would dramatically change where you put that token. So I read it as if the opponent is at range one of that token, you get you get the critical two. Um, that's what I thought, too. And so, like, for me, that's why I thought it was so dynamic in that way, whereas, like, I, I can put this next to you and get more offense, or I can put this next to me uh, and get more defense. Or if we're both next to range one of it, where we're both, I'm getting both benefits, and that's that's a good, that's a good thing. It it definitely adds decision trees to units that are going to have it that aren't your standard gunline decision trees. Like 
Am I moving or am I aiming? Am I dodging? Am, am I shooting? Am I moving and shooting? Getting to add one more decision to that tree, uh, even if it's just at the beginning of the game, helps evolve the level of gameplay throughout. And and so I really like this keyword. It's very dynamic. I, I'm excited. I was While you were talking, I was thinking there's a really cool little setup you could do with intercept here if you position the the token kind of between your home let's say we're playing major offensive because we're boring Mm -hmm. (laughs) if you position it between your home intercept in the middle and you kind of put it slightly towards the the center point and you have uh let's say like a core squad with this you could be capping your home point you can shoot not have to aim because you get the critical two then move forward into the position and get better defense for scoring so it'll let you be a little bit more mobile with kind of how many people you have to cap your back point while still getting a dice boost as you step up to contest the middle on like turn four. Uh, so for so you could almost use it as like a defensive layer. It's like a little mini barricade. For me, this keyword I think is going to pair really well with uh, one of the keywords we're going to see further down the line with uh, we're not regs. Um, just because... If they can't share tokens from uh, regular clone troopers, then giving them a chance to up their defense is going to be pretty important uh, to making sure that they see the table. Mm-hmm. Do you want to just jump into that one? Then yeah. See other new keyword versus updates. Uh, so we're not regs. A unit with we're not reg keywords may not spend green tokens on another clone trooper unit. And other clone trooper units may not spend that unit's green tokens. The fire support keyword cannot be used while a unit with we're not regs keywords is performing an attack. Uh, <clears throat> it is a boost to uh, curbing the clone menace as it was, as it were, uh, and, and as it will be, as it will forever be. Uh, I would like to just stop in real quick and say hey clones are bad but it was worse when they weren't in the meta at all it sucked it wasn't fun uh and so being able to find ways around keeping them from being overpoweringly good is something that uh amg is going to have to contend with until uh the day that they decide to rewrite the rule book uh when they decide to rewrite the rulebook, I hope that they keep the core personality of clone because one of the things that as a, a clone player that I love is that all of my core and all of my clone troopers have so many decision points. What I want from the rest of the game is for other units to also get that many decision points, not to have my decision points taken away. Uh, and so this is a way to do that. Now I can take... Uh, and I'm assuming this is all on Bad Batch, uh, maybe on the clone yeah, I, commandos. Yeah, it unlikely it's on a non-clone trooper. But I, I imagine this is on the Bad Batch, uh, and not being able to fire support with them means that you can give them uh, crazy ridiculous dice pools or crazy ridiculous keywords without fear that it's going to just be uh, overwhelming for, for the failed Um And being able to take away their token share means that they can't auto-cycle all of those abilities into being crazy overpowered. Uh, And so I'm really liking that. Uh, And for me, this is why I think that this would be paired with uh, Complete the Mission. Because if you have Complete the Mission, now you're able to give yourself better defenses. You're able to give yourself better attacks. Uh without having to share tokens with with other people yeah i obviously this is not out yet but this is my favorite new keyword that i've seen from amg um this is really cool like you mentioned it gives them so much flexibility to make disgustingly powered units playable yeah you know you have you can make them do really crazy things because you know that they can't be fire supported you know, when you don't have to worry, you can make them have a 10 dice pool, a, a 14 die pool, if you know that it's not going to have 14 added on top of it. Like, it just gives them more more of a playground to work with. And I think that's a good thing. They can design that personality of a unit more without having to worry about breaking everything else in the faction as much. 
it, and if AMG is listening, AMG, I, I know you probably are listening because me and Mike have a great podcast going yeah. on here. Um, my suggestion would be more keywords like this. It would be, hey, maybe we take away fire support from the phase twos. Uh, and, and that'll open up a lot of doors for making those units uh, different. Because one of the reasons why clones do feel oppressive is because all of their core can do the same thing. And it's, I'm just going to throw out a chunk of dice and I'm going to have 10 aims to just throw it onto whatever the hell I want. Yeah, this one, um, for anyone who listens to Scoundrels as well, um, I was on there this week and we talked a little bit about how experimental droids almost have a clonish feeling because they have so many pre-round decision trees with the, with the tokens and they can essentially get all the free shit. Um, this is another thing in that in that vein of it, it seems to give you decisions. And that's like two of the last three releases slash spoils that we've seen um, are, are about making different choices. And that's, that's good for the game. Uh, I know I've been pretty pretty shitty in the past about you know things that they've released and things that i don't like so props props here this is this is really cool yeah i definitely want to make sure that i give them credit where where credit is due because this is one of those keywords where you're like oh okay it doesn't change the effects of the gameplay too crazy but it definitely gives you a barrier of like it can't get beyond x and now we don't have to worry that it's going to be cascaded into more and more bullshit <laughs> um even with this change cascade to discover and it's a new effect <laughs> <laughs> magic joke uh yeah. one of the, it's it's it is like the geos for me because i think the geo notions also have a lot of decision points uh that extra move is, is both menacing for players to play against but also for the person using it if you use that at the wrong time uh, you're going to get your geo blown off the board. And if you don't put your priority key token in the right place, then potentially you're going to lose out on your units that you paid a premium for faster than you wanted to. Yeah. So speaking of free decision-making, um, one of the other keywords that we got an update on was independent, um, which as we know is at the start of the activation phase, if a unit with the independent keyword does not have an order token, it gets you know, the bonus. Well, the update to this says if it doesn't have an order token, that unit may gain the listed token, parenthesis S, or perform the listed action as a free action. Which means essentially you could have like, instead of independent aim, you could have independent jump one. Nice. You know, or independent, I, I don't know. You could, I guess, independent take aim. So if you're a fleet trooper, you get ready. I don't know. I ran out of ideas it it definitely offers up <laughs> a lot of potential i was thinking that it was just going to be like independent free aim uh or independent dodge or independent standby um where if you're not taking it at at the the turn zero instead of instead of it being like it is on the pikes uh it's just independent aim uh free action and so you'll get the free action on your turn i don't think it means that pikes now can get free aims or free aim don't have to take the aim action they get free aim actions out of it or or anything like that on the current independent uh units mm -hmm. yeah i think this would be i'm hoping that this kind of functions similar to how the geonosians do um where they have that just like that free move they can do whenever um this one obviously is just a little bit of a different timing um but i think that's really cool uh i've not been the biggest proponent of independent in the past uh, I'm a large fan of making order control matter, so I'm hoping that this doesn't end up as widely spammed as it was with Shadow Collective, you know, and it's a little bit more selective with units going forward, but you know, a little bit more flexibility with previous keywords is never a bad thing. It's better than just continuously adding new words and making you remember them. Turn zero keywords are a problem. Uh, <laughs> they have been a problem from forever getting free tokens before the game before the round even begins uh is menacing <laughs> it is a menace uh and if shadow collective got more stuff regularly um <clears throat> i think players would still be complaining about it because uh as we'll talk about later pikes 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 are real good still <laughs> pikes pikes are real real nasty 
anytime that you get a passive buff to get free stuff mm -hmm. be a t-shirt yeah passive buffs to get free stuff um that's that's when you see bliss dominate you know if, when we used to see like the scouting that would give you the aims and, and things of that nature we've we've all been through those metas but that's always a really strong ability so hopefully they don't hopefully this one has been kind of kept in check but i'm excited yeah more like i said more flexibility uh um you want to move to interrogate yeah uh so interrogate uh, during the command phase, if a player reveals a command card that belongs to a unit at range one of one or more enemy units that in, that have the uh, interrogate keyword, and there would be a tie for priority, treat the command card as having one more pip. This is basically just cunning, but you have to be near the opponent, right? Yes, it, it is cunning. Um, and it, it's one of the things that we haven't really discussed a lot about the seventh sister uh in in discussions that we've had about the inquisitors um if you pair the inquisitor with krennic or with Callus, uh you pretty much guarantee that you're always going to have priority when she's near uh another unit which is just bonkers um because essentially if you if you throw out a, a two pip and your opponent also throws out a two pip, now you have a three pip. And uh, even if you throw out a one pip and they throw out a two pip, uh, and you're the inquisitor player, you you bump them up to a two. You're tied on two. You have cunning. You have priority. Uh, and so you can really have that control of when you're playing and when you're not playing and who when you're going first. Uh, which I really like. I really like that Empire's hopefully stepping into a more of a control style gameplay. Um, and, and if that's their, if that's what their army is going to be like, is just uh, control effects, uh, it'd be really interesting. Yeah, it would give a nice little faction identity. You know, it's something that they've kind of lacked for a while. So if their if their whole shtick is I dominate the command phase through different tricks and tweaks and things, that would be really neat, and it would be very empire ish. Yeah, uh, yeah they're they're an all encompassing empire. They're supposed to control things. You know, one of the things uh, that we'll we'll probably touch on later is faction identity, uh, and. I'll wait for us to get on that conversation to, to hit it. Hitting up the sure, RAM keyword so. first. Yeah, so this is actually good. And actually, it's a little bit of a buff to Fifth Brother. Um, so RAM X has been updated too. While a unit performs an attack using an attack pool that includes a weapon with the RAM X keyword, during the modify attack dice step, it may change X results to crit results if it meets either of the following conditions. The unit leader has a notched base, and the unit performed at least one full standard move at its maximum speed during the same activation as an attack using Ramex, aka how it's always worked for Tauntauns. Or, the unit leader has a small base, and the unit performed at least one move during the same activation as an attack using Ramex. So basically, Fifth Brother does not need to move at full speed, he just needs to move during his activation and Ram will trigger. Which I think is good. That makes it way less clunky, especially considering we don't actually move along the tools anymore. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense, especially on a small base trooper. Like, if I'm going to try to charge somebody, I don't need to move my full amount. I'm just going to rush at them. Yeah, just give me two steps. And I'm two good. steps and I'm good. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, and he probably needs the offensive output that that gives him. Uh, his lightsaber is not not stellar, you know, none of, neither one of the, the uh, Inquisitors have stellar lightsabers. Um, not that they're bad lightsabers. Their lightsabers are pretty dangerous, just like any other lightsaber user. Um, but being able to turn on RAM, uh, even after just a short hop, is, is necessary for boosting it up. Yeah. I mean, they're significantly weaker with only Pierce 1. Yeah. So, and only five dice. We've seen how badly Commander Luke can whip. So when you take away a die, <laughs> hell, Sabine and it on the black dice. It's not the best. Sabine, Sabine's hit that note too, right? Like, the, oh, yeah, there's the a there's a reason why the dark saber wasn't ever uh, has has been hotly debated as whether or not you take it or or, or not on Sabine. You take it, uh, 
But <laughs> oh, maybe three years ago, maybe three years ago, fifteen points is a lot. But Dauntless is still pretty decent on your really tanky unit. I, She's well overcosted if if we're looking at the Inquisitors. Just we we can both agree on that one at least. Yeah, she needs she needs points cut, but um, but now I think that's a good RAM update. You know, it clarifies things, and uh, it just makes it cleaner rules wise. So, Rich, um, I believe you did pretty well at a tournament the other week. I did. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, a couple of your games. Figured we could just spend a few minutes on each, kind of like a brief summary of what happened and like. A, a talking point or two yeah uh so last week at battleground games in saugus uh uh anthony bonomo uh graciously held a tournament to to try to rebuild some of our community after the pandemic um so there was going to be a lot of newer players there and and because of that uh he instructed me not to be a tryhard and not bring my yoda list uh and so i didn't bring my yoda list i brought uh din and boba uh, with two pikes, two vets, uh, two MK turrets, and a capo and a commander. Uh, ten activations. Uh, all of them had SA except the MK turrets and the commanders. Uh, and it was okay. It was pretty good. Uh, I ended up winning. Uh, my first game... Uh, was against the Wookiee Battle Force, and I was pretty sure that this was going to be one of the hardest matchups that I had, uh, just in terms of was I going to have enough dice to actually take things down? Uh, what was I going to do once they actually got into melee? Um, and it started off pretty quick. By turn, by turn two, uh, the Wookiees had mauled Din and pretty much killed him. Uh, Boba was looking pretty rough. He was on like three wounds by the end of turn three. Uh, but those pikes just with their loaded up dice, uh, were able to mow down the, the Wookiees fast enough that, uh, I was able to pretty much, I think I killed everything except the Wookiee Chieftain or no, I killed the Wookiee Chieftain. I, I couldn't kill his shooty Wookiees. They were just too far away and, and I didn't have enough dice to, to take him on at the end. Uh, I managed to stop his bomb cart just in the nick of time. We were playing payload. Uh, oh, that's a tough one versus the Wookiees. I, uh, I had started that match off with a uh, Boba rocket shot into his Chewbacca, who I had bountied with Din. Uh, and so it kind of scared Chewie off. Chewie had you know four wounds at the beginning of the game at the beginning of the game and so he was out of the the game for a long enough time uh that he was the only person chasing or keeping his bomb cart moving uh and i managed to to get a few good shots into him with the range four guns from the uh pikes and from uh boba fett and and get him dead just in the nick of time to stop his bomb cart from moving so that mine could touch uh, on the other side. Uh, game two. So was this the was this the Chewy Chieftain version? This with, um, yeah, uh, with like a lot of battle shields. Or... It was Chewy Chieftain, uh, four or five battle shield Wookies, and then one Shooty Wook. Uh, okay. An absolute menace with the in, with the shields up with the free moves. When they put the shields down, they're adding two red to their attacks. You know, uh, Din does not have a lot of dice. Turns out that like five dice into melee and a Wookiee is not, <laughs> not great. Uh, luckily I had the, oh, come on, man, you, you can't take two models. <laughs> I, I luckily had the flame projector on both him and Boba, uh, which, which allowed me to like singe enough of the Wookiee here off of, off of them that, uh, the rest of the squad can get him down. One of the key plays in that game was Boba using his whipcord launcher right before he died uh, to disengage with the Wookiee squad. Now that Wookiee squad couldn't move, and I just blew them off the board uh, with pikes just standing in front of them. It was uh, it was good. It was good and, and scary. Uh, 
the next game was against the uh, Shadow Collective Supermandos, uh, which was Gar Saxon, uh, three squads of the Super Commando Mandos with the precise one gun, uh, two Pike squads with uh, the Aim Cash guy, uh, and then two Capos. Uh, and we played uh, Sabotage the Moist Evaporators uh, and battle lines uh <clears throat> and so he came off really hot and and uh started blowing up my things uh really quickly but i had bountied one of his capos that he had put on the other end of the board away from all of his other stuff uh and din was off on his own and and din got there by the end of turn two he was able to kill the bounty uh engage a squad of pikes and you know basically lay claim to his far evaporator and and have control of it this was one of the matchups that i was also pretty worried about my list does not have a lot of pierce uh and so I, i'm relying on just sheer numbers of the pike squads to kill units and to break down those dice his mandos saved really hot at first uh <laughs> i between the shields, the dodges, the cover, uh, you know, his rockets were were doing work and 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 getting things down in in a quick manner. Uh, but luckily, just the sheer volume of dice that you're throwing with those pikes and with the vets at range four uh, was enough to overcome it. Uh, and that and that one also. Uh, by the end of it, it looked like I was going to end up tabling him too. And again, just on the sheer backs of, of the uh, pikes, the, at one point, you know, he shot into my pikes with, got four or five hits through after the dodges, uh, and the pikes just saved. They just saved out. And it's like, oh, well, good luck. That, that, that happens. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and then my final game of the night, uh, was against Darth Vader and uh, Stormtroopers. And uh, how I managed to win that one was pure luck. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you need a so, Sometimes you just need that. Um, I managed to uh, get him to bite on a Din move with his Vader uh, by jumping... Din, it was intercept the transmissions, jumping Din towards his his far safe uh, intercept point, uh, and so he charged Vader after Din, swings into Din, uh, completely whiffs because I had a dodge and uh, my Din was with the spear. I I think the spear is the one you want if you don't have a Jedi of your own, uh, just to be able to fight and protect against Jedi. Right, that gives him immune. Pierce it gives him immune right? Pierce, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I roll out five for five. Mando saves doing Mando saves, and I take no wounds. Uh, he drops implacable for the next turn. Uh, and, and and what I would say is a bit of a misplay. He didn't push my din out to get shot. He kind of just let a lot of his activations go through. Uh, and at this point, I'm fine waiting for din. Um, one of the things that I found with din to be very true is the comms relay is very necessary for him. You want to be able to get his orders off of him and get him extra tokens. Uh, and so, you know, I was able to comms relay off to one of the commanders that I had improvised orders on, uh, so that I had two shots to pull him when I needed him. Um, but he waited literally very close to the end of, of, uh, that round before he went with Vader, pushed my guy up, pushed in off and went racing down uh, to go back to the middle of the fight where he realized he was being outgunned pretty dramatically uh, by Boba in the game. Uh, and, and it worked. It worked in my favor. So you mentioned that your TO asked you not to not to try hard. So you decided to give yourself payload against Wookiees, VAPs against Mando Spam, and then intercept against Vader and Gunline. <laughs> no, 
nothing if not a direction follower. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, going into each of those matches, I I felt like, oh, this is an uphill fight. I have, I'm going to have an uphill fight here, but I didn't feel overwhelmed and and um. It's one of those. It, it's one of those things that we've talked about before. Does a good pilot make a difference in a list? I'm not the best pilot in the world, uh, but you know, my my piloting skills are pretty decent with Din and, and Boba, and I was able to control the battlefield um, in such a way that I was able to get the the objective done in a, in an efficient manner. And a, again, those pikes. Oh. They, when they hit, they hit. My pikes rolled hot all day. Um, even when they weren't having the double aims, I was regularly getting four or five after cover. Uh, and people didn't want to shoot them. No one wants to shoot them uh, because they have two dodges. They have outmaneuver. They have more dodges coming from the rebel commander. They got more dodges coming when the capo goes up. Uh, and... Uh, Danger sense when when you do finally get a hit through, it's one hit, and now they're rolling danger sense too, and it's it's just not fun. It's not it's oppressive. It can be oppressive. Um, yeah. And and so when you're coming against them in a traditional gun line, they outrange you. They they are more than happy to play the range three game if you actually get there. And because Boba's also at range three and Din's off doing whatever the hell Din's gonna do. It gave you an opportunity to step in and and take shots the way that you wanted to take shots, and uh, you know, a simple man added on to all of the gun lines attacks really makes a difference. Uh, if Din is nearby, uh, Boba and gets to use a simple man, he loves it. And Din really loves that extra die. Do you mean a three pip rule with respect? Rule with respect. Sorry, that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No worries. No worries. Uh, I don't take too many quotes. I don't take a simple man. I don't think. I was actually going to ask you after your soliloquy what the command hand was because I think there's some really interesting choices there. Uh, so my command hand for that list is Boba's uh, whipcord launcher, uh, discretion, which is the it's I think it's discretion, right? That's the two pip for the the neutral That's, two pip. Yeah, it's either aggression or the discretion. Yeah, the Merc two pip. Yeah. Uh, Boba's rocket launcher in case I have some vehicle matchups. Um, and then, uh, uh, rule with respect. Uh, and then Din's one pip and Din's two pip. Uh, that makes sense. I don't like whistling birds. I think it 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 promises big things, but never never delivers. Range one is really really difficult to give up an action to be able to take that kind of thing. Din doesn't have the actions. He, he just doesn't have the actions to do that. Right, and if you put him in a position and it does with, you've now surrounded him by multiple units and he can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it, it, it's one of those cards that looks better than it actually is. It's like the Ambam rifle. I really like the Ambam rifle. Uh, and whenever I don't have it, I wish I had it. But whenever I do have it, I wish I had the spare. Um, it, two actions is a lot. It's a lot. Two actions to, to make an attack that could potentially only do one wound is a lot. And if you do get into melee, which is where he wants to be living anyways, um, you're 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 behind the eight ball. You don't have Pierce. You don't have uh, a, a lot of dice to consistently do damage to things. Yeah, it, I mean, it has immobilize, but you have to do damage to get the immobilize, and you don't always have the ability to get that damage through, especially against some of those tougher targets. Yeah. So now that we've kind of talked about the tournament, let's say we're going to do a debrief, and you're kind of taking stock of your results, you're taking stock of how your list functioned. Let's talk about how you actually do that. And not you, spe not necessarily you specifically, but the royal you. Like, what are some points that players should look for when you're when you're taking into account like luck, matchups, tables, etc., like how do you break that down? Uh, so the first thing that I I like to do personally is is uh, look at the points of in a game where my opponent made the mistake, and if they hadn't made that mistake, uh, it, and I just do that because 
that is a form of luck, right? If if your opponent is making a mistake, you can't count on your opponent making a mistake at a high level, right? At a high level game, uh, at Worlds, I would never expect to be playing against you or or uh, Mike Barry or, or Kyle or any of the other amazing players that make up the game uh, and think that I was going to be able to bait Vader into attacking Din. It's just not something that I would think that I, I, I'd, I'd get. Um, because one, they'd look at his upgrade and see, oh, well, he's got immune pair, so I'm not going to charge into that. Two, I, I need my Vader to be over here. I can't, I can't afford a, a diversion. Uh, and, and so that's one of the things you, you can't rely on your opponent's mistakes to bail you out in at high level play. And so those are the first things I look for. Yeah, the, the big thing for me is when I'm looking at a debrief, um, I'm looking for interactions because one of the things that Legion struggles with compared to other games, and I would say most tabletop games struggle with, is their games are long. You have small sample sizes. So you might get 15 reps and be like, that's a lot for me. Yeah. But really, that's really not a whole lot of interaction. Like there's not a lot of dice, var- there's a lot of dice variance that goes into that. But you're looking for how do things interact. So if you're making a build and your concept is, I know I play in an Ewok Wookiee heavy meta. I know I need a lot of range two dice. How did your range two pools actually fare? And not necessarily did they spike or did they whiff, but did you feel like you put your units in a position so that the pool could be effective? Did you feel like you had enough support to make the pool effective? And what could you do differently? Like you mentioned with the Din Invader, you know, did you give yourself the situation to distract an opposing Jedi? And did it go better than expected? Probably. But did you have a tool to deal with a situation? I think that's one of the biggest takeaways when you're looking at a you know a small three game sample size there. Yeah, uh, and and being able to recognize uh, what was a a spike in unexpected, uh, and what is like a failure of your list. Right, I knew my list didn't have a lot of pairs, uh, and so when I was facing that Mando commander list and it was just saving in my head. I'm going, well, man, if I had a sniper here, if I had a commando here, if I had a commando there, uh, am I, am I doing appreciatively better here? Um, or is just the bucket of dice going to bail me out? And you know, the d- bucket of dice did bail me out. Uh, but you know, it, it's one of the points where I'm going to look at that list and say, if there's any way to upgrade, so that there is a little bit more pairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you're talking about things like that as well, one of the reasons that I like to take pictures of all of my games before I start with the table is there's a lot of times where if you lose a game of Legion, you get upset, obviously, and you're like, ah, fuck, the table was terrible and there's nothing I can do about it. And if you can dis or if you can detach and look back later after the event when you've calmed down, you've got your picture to look at and say, Well, this is what I thought ruined me, but I actually just played this poorly gives you another way to see is it a list fault is it a matchup fault or is it just user error because that happens (laughs) yeah um so being able to to get all the info while you're there and then take it away when you're when your head's a little cooler helps tremendously as well and the same thing with matchups too so make sure that if you feel like your list fell apart because your interactions are poor you know what did you match up against and do you think that's something you're going to see a lot of that that is one of the the crazy part of legions there's so many interactions nowadays that you might not know all of the things that are going to happen uh a few weeks ago i was playing against uh a shadow collective list with a bus um and i didn't realize that uh turn one a bus could get into a position where it could block my payload from moving uh and so a matchup that i thought was like you know tough but something that i could win at became something oh turn one my payload's not moving that bus isn't going to die. It's going to unload those black suns. This game is over, done, <laughs> can't be won. Awesome. Uh, you you stop and you, you take stock and be like, well, okay, now I know if I see a bus, we're not playing payload. <laughs> yeah, especially if not if it has black suns with it. Yeah. That's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, and, and sometimes and sometimes that's just how it goes. You don't, you won't know until you've experienced it. Uh, which is, you know, one of the reasons why you want to listen to some of the podcasts and, and watch a few games on stream because people do some cool things and 
uh, talk about some cool things and, and give you a better sample size, you know? Yeah. Speaking of the own stream, um, like David with, um, Yavin base and, uh, the, that's in a moon podcast guys who just did the Legion world championships. All this stuff is botted and it's all on YouTube. So if you want to see how these quote unquote high powered lists play, you can literally go watch them. Now I'd recommend putting it on like three to four times speed so that you're not sitting there for three and a half hours. Um, but you can still watch how the units go and you can see essentially like what the dice pools look like and just see positioning and interactions and such. And it's a great way to take an objective stance because you're not involved in the situation. So you have no emotional stock in the attachment, or I'm sorry, no emotional attachments to the decisions made other than did it work or did it not? Uh, and, and I'd also say, and you know, this one's for me, especially not, not for me, especially one of the things that I consider, uh, we, we've talked a lot lately about the meta and what the meta is and isn't. And one of the things that if you've been playing Legion for a while, you've noticed a lot of the high level players will hop from one faction to another based off of literally just some results that they saw and, and seeing that a list is better than they thought, you know, Kyle wins a, a major with, uh, with, uh, blizzard force and then all of a sudden the next four tournaments everybody's playing blizzard force uh dash wins kyle wins with mall b2s and all of a yeah. sudden mall b2s is everywhere you know uh the guy in the right hand corner aka mike barry uh wins with uh yoda padme and all of a sudden yoda padme is everywhere uh and people look at it and go well that's a menace now that's a problem and the truth of the matter is, is like, well, it's a problem because a lot of people are playing it, not because it's actually unbeatable. These lists have faults. They have places and ways that they can be beat with unique and interesting things. Uh, but when the best players in the world are playing those lists, it's going to be a problem. You know, Mike Barry playing Jin Erso. Is Jin Erso all of a sudden the hot new meta, the, the thing that like everybody should be playing? I don't think so. But... If Mike Barry's playing Jin Urso, he's going to do well because he's one of the best players in the game. Um, and, and so that's also a thing that I would take a look at when you're trying to debrief is like, hey, how experienced were my opponents? Did my opponents know what I was trying to do? Uh, were they able to counter what I was trying to do? Or was their list just unable to counter what I was trying to do because it was something that they couldn't prepare for because they didn't know? Yeah, familiarity of opponents is a big thing, too, tying into that. If you have scrim partners and you're constantly playing against them, you learn each other's tendencies. And I know you and I play against each other <laughs> a lot. We know how we play. Um, you know, if if your opponent, if you deploy in a certain setup, I generally know what you're going to do out of that setup, which is different than if I just walk up to a table and play somebody for the first time. Yeah. Um, so when you're, when you're recapping that, like, we just played a, a test game of like one of the Wookiee battle forces versus my world's list. And we specifically played an objective that neither of us would normally allow through or play so that we can see more list interaction. Because if we play the regular KP, both of us know how we're going to approach this. But if we played something a little bit more explosive, because we ended up playing hostage, um, it's something that we wouldn't really see in that situation. And it lets us see how units and pieces interact with each other in orders and, and management. Man, that was a fun so game. So if you know that you're playing against your brother or your good buddy, like mix up the battle cards a little bit so you can see different play styles and different strategies to get better better data. Just get a wider range. Trying objectives that you're not good at is one of the things that I've I've endeavored for my 2024 year is to try to take on objectives that I don't normally play. Uh, and that I would normally veto so that if I end up in a situation where I have to play it, I can at least approach it in a better manner. I think that makes sense. Do you want to talk a little bit about, um, I know we kind of skipped over the section earlier. So let's, since you've mentioned like goal for the upcoming season, we wanted to talk a little bit about the season that was obviously Adepticon hasn't happened yet. It's about three weeks away. But the competitive qualifier season is over, and we're already starting to get details and tournaments for things that are happening after Adepticon. So let's talk a little bit about like what is your goal for the upcoming season, and how did you like this year? How did this year go for you? What were some of the positives? What do you want to see altered? We can kind of go from there. 
Let's start with the goals for the upcoming year. Since you uh, started to talk about that. So I narrowly missed uh, a top eight at my, my three major tournaments this year. Um, and so I'd like, I'd like to hit one of those top eights. I feel like I'm, I'm a knocking, uh, and you know, that just requires an, uh, hitting that next level of focus and, and being a little bit more prepared. Yeah. I think the preparation has been key because you've, you finished what ninth twice, uh, 10th twice. Yeah. 10th twice. Okay. I know I was, oh, I was one of the ninths, right? Yeah. Yes. Cause Nick beat us both out by that. One fucking like twenty total kill points. Ooh, it happens. It happens. You know. It does it does it does? Everybody loves Nick Podner. Yeah, my uh, my goal for this upcoming season is just to try to play more events. Um, this year was a little unfortunate for me in that everything fell on a work weekend, so I'm trying to be a little bit more proactive about getting to events. I know I'm not going to get to travel as much this year. Um, I've got to like pretty large personal vacations coming up. Uh, so I don't have as much time to get off for the cons. Uh, so I want to make sure that I can get to more of the local events and stay sharp. Cause I know I'm not going to have the chance to play the competitive circuit as hard as I did this year. Yeah. England and Korea sound a little bit more fun. So e- England and Korea sound there. a whole <laughs> lot more fun to me. Um, Hey, who knows? Maybe bring some Legion stuff with you. You'll get a game in in England and a game in in Korea. This... Then I got to check my bag. man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, so I, I just want to I want to play more local events and try to try to make that work a little bit more. I I think that is an, another goal for me as well is to uh, try to help revitalize our local scene. It, it's been I've been really busy myself and uh, just getting time to play is is a lot. But getting a regular play helps build the community and helps build those tournaments and helps build those skills to be able to do it. So talking about this year, I think it was a little bit of a mixed bag when it comes to organized play. Um, Personally, I like the fact that there were so many events. It felt like, I don't want to say it felt like the old days because the old days never really started, but it definitely felt great that you could check Discord, check Facebook, and just about every weekend there was some kind of event going on that had 40 plus players whether that was in in your local area if that was across the world but you could follow you could follow it like that was fantastic i think we need to keep that going i think the community has done a great job of running with it and taking advantage of the fact that you can get like all of these invite kits passed out so i think that's fantastic we've definitely grown we've grown yes and it's it seems like it's just rather sustainable Mm -hmm. you know we're not there's a lot of larger events that didn't get as large as I know the organizers were hoping. There's still a ton of last minute cancellations. Life happens, travel happens. Um, so I would I hope that we continue to grow up, but at least we didn't stagnate. You know, it's slow, steady growth there. It, it's just, a, it really is a commitment to, to do a day of Legion, let alone two to three days of Legion. Uh, and it can be tiring. So I, I understand where people are coming from in, in, in that aspect. Uh, but the Warhammer 40k guys do it, and uh, if they can do it, then why can't I? Yeah, I mean, come on. They're playing 40k. We've already playing 40k. It's just, superior. you know, yeah. come on. Yeah. Uh, um, I do, my, my negative for the year, though, is man, oh, man, does communication need to be more consistent. I appreciate that there are channels that we can contact the organized play, play people. You know, it's great that there's emails out there. It's great that there are staff in Discord, uh, especially the unofficial ones that will actually answer your questions and give you information. I appreciate it. I love it. I understand that it's a small team, but if you're going to be handing out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of invites around the world, I think there needs to be more of a dedicated communication line. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to agree that there's been a lot of positives over the last year in terms of like, they've been pretty responsive to handling keyword in and uh point changes and problems that they see with the meta i might not agree with all of the problems that they see in the meta but at least they've been willing to work on them uh but i am going to push back and say like hey i get that their team is small but as a customer as, as someone who is putting my time and money into this product uh i have higher expectations than than the expectations that they're meeting um 
you know, I don't expect them to do what Alex and Luke were doing. The game has probably gotten too big for that. And they have a lot more load than Alex and Luke had uh, in terms of games that they're, they're managing. Uh, do you mean like traveling to events? Traveling to events, doing reveals, talking on podcasts almost almost every month back when back in, when FFG had the game. One, one or both of those guys were on someone's podcast talking about it, talking about a reveal, talking about what was coming down the pipeline, talking about how they wanted to make the game better, where they developed from and where they came from as developers to come up with concepts. I don't expect all of that. That that was crazy. It was awesome to have, but you know, the game is too large for that. They're handling four or five games, so I can't expect that from them. Uh, but I can say that uh, I want more releases, uh, and I want them to have uh, more team members on their team to be able to do regular releases because you know w- what kills a game fast and what makes a game feel stale fast is when there aren't as many releases as as there could be. When looking back at this... And, and I mean, like, physical releases. Yeah, like physical, physical releases. plastic. Yeah. The, the Battle Forces are great. I'm glad we're getting content. But, like, give us plastic. That's what yeah. gets people in the stores. That's what gets that's what gets store owners happy because people are coming in. They're selling people stuff. are seeing other people yeah. play. Like, that's... It's needed. You uh, can't have four releases a year. Yeah. We, we had... We just didn't have enough releases this last year. Uh... The battle forces are great, and I want to see. I want to see more battle forces. I do. I want to see more print and play stuff. That's fine. Uh, but like card packs, that should be a thing that they're doing on a yearly basis. Just generic card packs for for updating the game, for keeping the game fresh, for adding new units. Um, I want to see that. I want to see um, more more. OP kits because I felt like the OP kits that they did were very themed but if I wasn't playing Ewoks the Ewoks wild ride doesn't seem as exciting to me as uh, you know some of the past OP kits were where we were getting dice or cards or whatever just for coming in to play have a league um, and and I w- they used to do like the escalation kit prizes. the escalation kit prizes and, and stuff like that and and like you said, the communication has felt a little a little too light. You know, it was great that they dropped this RRG stuff uh, to give us a little feast. But I remember very specifically, I would check the FFG website twice, twice, three times a month or so, just because there was a new article for what was coming up. There was a preview article of uh, something that was being released very soon. And then there was like a hobby or whatever article that popped up as well to, to fill in that, that upgrade. It was community building. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't feel like they have done enough to build community on their end, uh, which is where there's a disconnect. I, I, want, I want to play this game for a long time. I want this game to be very successful. Um, I, I have put in a lot of time, money, and energy into playing this game. Uh, I've been rewarded with some of the greatest friends that I could possibly make in this game, in, in, in real life, you know. Mike, uh, you, and 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 Zach, and uh, Nick, and, and the whole gang, you know. It, it, it has been very kind to me uh, in terms of a community. And I don't feel like they've given that enough love on their end. Yeah, my big... we Talking about release dates, we have Inquisitors. This is tied in, I promise. Mm-hmm. We know Inquisitors are coming like the day lists are due. And then we don't really have a hard release date for the next things. I'm really hoping that... I actually hope that April is silent. Um, I think that giving the company a month to evaluate feedback of... like So AMG will... I assume be present at Worlds. Uh, I find it unlikely that they will not send at least one or two delegates to their entire game systems world championships, right? Yeah. They're going to get feedback. They've gotten a lot of feedback via email. They've gotten a lot of questions about the event because of the TO change. Like there's a lot of information coming into them. And I think if they just said at, after Worlds, like, hey, we're going to take the next 
I'll say 30 days to evaluate the feedback, talk internally about a plan, see if it met our expectations, see where things have differed based on feedback, and just give us a roadmap. They've been great uh, in the past when they did, um, was it Gen Con last year that they did the roadmap? Uh, Mini Stravaganza, I think was the last yeah, time was this, where we got. September, right? Yeah. Yeah, like that roadmap's great. They gave us actual information. They gave us cool models. They gave us their philosophy and their thinking. Like that was an awesome idea and it's fantastic. And I would love to see them do something very similar with post Adepticon feedback of this is what we did well. This is what we didn't do well. This is what we plan to do to address that. You know, this is our goal going forward. And I think just a little bit of honesty and communication would go a long way and would just really set the game up to continue to go well. More objectives. More objectives, yes. Please give us more battle cards. I'm tired of playing Please. the same ones. But... Please. <laughs> Please. Even if we just even if we just update them or like change the scoring concept. Like that would be cool. But I'm tired of playing the same objectives. Just like <laughs> two more guys. Please. Just something fresh. Uh and and you know I don't when I say that I need releases to be more abundant than they have been, I'm not talking about what FFG was doing. FFG was trying to establish a game. The game's established, uh, but definitely more than five, right? It needs to be more than one or two a quarter. It needs yes. it needs to be, uh, you know, two you to three a quarter. Armies. Yeah, you have five armies that people have bought into. The I, I would assume that ten a year should be the minimum. Yeah, uh, it's it, it's only it's only one release every six months per army. Because yeah. I'm going to count Shadow Collective because people bought into that assuming it was a faction slash army. And that it was going to get support. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, like, that doesn't seem crazy for me because – just because, like, well, I mean, it's Star Wars. There are an infinite number of things that you could just pull and, and, and put together um, that have players excited you know yeah. take five They're doing it with shatterpoint i think they've like i think they've shown that they have the ability to to pull thematic star wars units from all levels of canon yeah and do it well like shatterpoint's units are really neat it like and i would love to see some of that pulled into legion like look r2 with a dish tray on top of his head where he's serving drinks it's like well that's a completely different r2 than the other r2 mm -hmm. well why can't we have that <laughs> yeah. you know uh, and and I don't want to be too negative on them because they they are trying and their team is small. But my answer to someone saying that their team is small is well, then it sounds like they should hire more people because I'm paying enough money <laughs> and I'm willing to pay more money that they're not getting right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's 2024. You can expand your team. Say la vie there. Uh, but it has been a good season. This this past year has been good. One of the things uh, that I've liked from AMG, and I want to make sure that I include this, is that the keywords that they've added have been all very fun and very thematic. Uh, jump one for for uh, Geonosians, these advanced targeting stuff. Uh, you know, they're dynamic, and they offer different levels of gameplay that hadn't existed before. And that's really neat. Do you want to kind of move into this final segment? I can just take a couple minutes to wrap up. What are you bringing to Worlds, Mike? Yeah, so depending on our schedule, this might be our last recording before Adepticon. So technically, we would be due to record again in two weeks, and we drop about three days before Adepticon. But... We're probably going to push that off a week and just do an Adepticon breakdown afterwards. So I would expect like a three and a half week wait for the next one just with Worlds happening. So I figured I'd talk about what I was actually bringing to Worlds. And if you listen to Scoundrels this week, you can go ahead and just shut this off. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it because <laughs> I did cover that there as well. Um, but I did, after many, many games, decide to bring Anakin Padme and some SA Dodge Spam. What? I know, I'm so boring. However, I do think I made a tweak. So you and I have talked a lot about uh, pikes today, and pikes are very good. Another thing that's very good is full arc troopers. And we've played a ton of them. We've seen a lot of them since Crucible especially. 
um, especially since 501st as well. So I decided to do Anakin Padme, two DC captains with SA and RPS, two full arcs with SA and DC, and then an Echo Strike. So essentially, I turn the pikes into full arcs. Little little higher risk reward. You know, they've got more dice at range two. I've got way more access to Pierce. But my models are also a little bit more expensive, and I don't have the danger sense shenanigans and dodge spam shenanigans with them. So a little, you know, little higher risk, higher reward. Um, but I've also done Anakin with barrier, stance, push, and then Padme with improv and seize. Because I do find that without the clone commander, I do need a little bit of bag help sometimes. So what is it that made you go with Anakin over Yoda here? Uh, for me, it's been consistency. Um, I think the issue that I've run into playing Yoda recently is that you can hard tech into Yoda. As a, oh, Sorry, an opponent can hard tech to counter Yoda. Does that mean that list that's hard countering Yoda is good against the field? Not at all. But it's a thing that we've seen. And it's something that I've run into multiple times in multiple different variations. And in a one-and-done format for Worlds, I don't feel confident that I won't see it again. It's a little harder to counter Anakin, simply because he's not as strong as Yoda individually, but he's also a little bit more flexible in that he doesn't have to dedicate an entire game plan to himself. If you have something like armor, you can just send Annie after the armor with his lightsaber. Can't really do that as much with Yoda because Yoda needs to be near the army to use guidance to get his actions and things like that. You know, you can Anakin can function solo a little bit more. And I just felt that in a situation where I needed to essentially go 3-0, 3-0, 2-0, I know there's a possibility for 3-1 depending on how many people show up. But if I can't afford a loss, I think Anakin gives me a better chance against the field as a whole. And if I have a bad dice roll and he takes five wounds, I think my army is better equipped to deal with the leftovers than if I lose Yoda in one shot. Because it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's it's only a five or six die roll. <laughs> like, that's going to spike poorly. Uh, and, the, and those extra 40 points can make all of the difference in that list. You know, you're talking about DC captains rather than uh, mortars. You're talking about... SA on all of the things that you have so that you're more defensively resilient. Uh, it, it seems like a good list to me. Um, and I would expect you and it to do well. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm gunning for two and one. I, I think, I mean, obviously I'm gunning to win, but I think realistically two and one is a result that I'll be happy with. Um, I went one and two last year and I was 17 kill points and two millimeters of terrain sorry terrain height away from 3-0 so i i think i played pretty well last year i got a little unlucky in a couple points which happens mm -hmm. you know, is what it is so i definitely want to improve to two and one this year um so i'm fairly confident i can get to that but i would like to get three and and i think this gives me the best chance the um obviously one of the counters that we talked about last week that does sometimes work against clones is heavy suppression stacking um the captains are really good at avoiding that because there's been four or five situations now where like I need to tap a VAP or I need to get to a KP and I've got five suppression, but I just turned my captain on and now I can do it. Yeah. Now, granted, I've got that five at the end of the turn plus whatever shots come my way, but the objective has been secured. Yeah. And that's been absolutely game winning a couple times. That extra range really helps too in that, uh, you know, two red critical one add to an arc trooper fire support is very exd ish um and I, I suspect that you'll probably see a number of exd at at worlds this year uh it's a good list we, we discussed exd uh pretty early between the two of us after it came out uh and it, it's, even tested it a few times yeah it, it's starting to it's starting to make the rounds uh in popularity uh, because it does have it does have a clone like feel uh, with with all those extra tokens that can do a lot of different things, um, and Anakin kind of answers those guys too because if he gets in, uh, they're done. They're just done. Yeah. The so EXD is actually why, as you know, I was I was on saber throw Anakin for quite a while. Um, and experimental droids and ranged Wookiees in the Battle Force are actually why I'm back on Barrier. 
um, I need to at least eliminate one or two of those piercing dice. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just a necessity. You know, as any clone player date activation knows, you don't have a lot of bodies once they start dropping. And if I if I auto block two of them a turn, it's it's just going to be better than the saber throw, and I'll take my chances with the RPS fire supports until I can dark trooper. Can't can't take down uh, a whole a whole army if you're if you're being chunked off piece by piece. Right. Um, and then I ended up with the the arcs over the pikes, um, mainly because of the melee skews. Uh, I just you need those extra dice, and you need the pierce to ensure that your shots into the Ewoks and the Wookies hit. And the arcs still do roll two die for melee, and uh, like we d- did in our testing game, the arcs punched back hard against the Wookies, and were the only reason that I was even in that towards round five. Arc melee is is much better than people think, but so is Pike. Uh, Pike melee eleven, <laughs> you know, twelve to eleven white dice. That's a that's a chunk of dice that you're just throwing. <laughs> um, it is, but they're non surging Yeah, and, and and they're not consistent. It's not consistent. Which is 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 the bad part? Where at least with the arcs, you know you're probably going to hit three or four of those black, maybe one or two of those white, and you're good. Yeah, and they have quasi—I don't want to call it quasi charge, but they can move, punch, and they have the aim. Yeah, and that's huge to mitigate some of those black non-surging dice. Massive, massive. So, um, that's kind of where I've settled. Um, I've accepted the fact that it is not the most optimal list build, but it does a lot of things well, and I don't think I'll get tabled. So I think if I play smart, I'll do I'll do pretty well. I mean, and it's fun to play. Anything's got to be better like than a key for me. The Magnus that you you played last year. Yeah, last year I was one of two double bounty players. Yeah. But thank you for everybody <laughs> who has hung out with us this morning. Uh, thanks, Rich, for recording super early with me this morning. I appreciate it. Um, so, like I said, we'll probably be back right after Adepticon. Um, I. I would be surprised if we do a recording beforehand. If we do, I'd imagine it's going to be like a half hour, 40 minute short change episode. Um, We'll kind of see what happens over the next couple weeks. If we get news to talk about, let's do it. But otherwise, um, if you're coming out to Worlds, um, please stop and say hi. You'll probably see me in the Callaway hat and Legion 99 jersey. It's what I wear to every goddamn tournament. (laughs) So um, come say hi. We'll get a beer together, play a game. Should be a good time. Um, I'll be in there Thursday to hang out at the tournament. I just couldn't burn another vacation day to actually play at it. So I'll be arriving around like round two. Um, but if you have any questions, as always, reach out to us here too. And uh, Rich, any final words before we run? Mike, kick butt. Uh, we we haven't yet got to the point where we're putting prop bets on Legion games, but if we... Oh, if dude, we... I've, been, I've been watching a ton of Counter-Strike. <laughs> and, uh, it's, all, it's all over it. So like, there, you could just bet on everything. Like even mid-game, the odds change. Maybe that's what we need to do to just grow legion hey, just inject betting hey you know when when yavin base was doing those points for 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 stuff it kind of made those games a lot a lot more fun <laughs> yeah you know let's just let's do it we'll, we'll talk today we'll just get our own illegal game <laughs> no one's gonna stop us right DraftKings can take on <laughs> bets everywhere why not <laughs> uh, all right everybody have a wonderful day and uh we'll see you at adepticon have a good one